Wedge Issues is brought to you by Wispolitics.com, a place where political insiders go for news, opinion, and campaign information. Once again, that's Wispolitics.com. Some of the first signs of a potential blue wave in Wisconsin came from Democratic victories in two special legislative elections. Patty Schachner won the 10th state Senate district in January, and Caleb Frostman won the first in June. Republicans hold an 18 to 15 majority in the state Senate, and Democrats are hopeful they can close that gap or even flip it in November. I'm Jesse Opoyan, and this is Wedge Issues, a Cap Times podcast about the 2018 elections in Wisconsin. Wisconsin Democrats are targeting a handful of state Senate districts throughout the state, and one of them is that first district, which puts Caleb Frostman in a rematch with State Representative Andre Jacques once again on November 6th, just a few months after Frostman won the special. This week, I talked with Caleb Frostman about his campaign and his relatively short time in the state Senate. And you should know that this interview was inspired in part by a Facebook post in which Caleb Frostman listed questions that he thinks he would never get in an interview but has prepared answers for. So, of course, I asked him those questions. But that's not all. On Monday, you can tune back in for another episode taking a look at the state's 17th Senate District, in particular, how the issue of transportation is playing there. My colleague Caitlin Farrell spent some time reporting on that, and I checked in with her. So be sure to check back on Monday for that. We'll get to my conversation with Caleb Frostman in just a few minutes, but first let's check in on this week's news with my colleague Eric Lawrence. Well, Eric, here we are back again, ready to look at the news of the week. Yes, we are indeed. Getting even closer to election day. Can you feel it? I can feel it in the air tonight. Have you been waiting for this moment for all your life? (laughs) I have. Okay. Well, then I won't keep you from it. (laughs) Let's Um, do it. Yeah, let's let's get going. Um, So uh, a couple things to talk about. First of all, I suppose we could talk about a new story that has come about today. Paul Jaden, who is currently, well, up until today, I think he resigned, right? Well, he submitted his letter of resignation, although apparently the uh, agency has not accepted it and they're just giving him a year of unpaid leave. But anyway. Interesting. Anyway, Paul Jaden, former? Director of Mad Rep, which is Madison Area Economic Development Agency, formerly the head of WEDIC, the private public economic development agency for the state, um, and also former mayor of Green Bay, if I believe. That's right. Anyway, this dude, he wrote a letter um, along with two former uh, Walker administrators, uh, basically criticizing the governor. Uh, tell us more, Jesse. What did what exactly did this letter say? That's right. So Paul Jaden was appointed by Walker to serve as his head of the Department of Commerce in 2010. That department was then turned into the quasi-public Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Paul Jaden oversaw that in its early years, and he left in 2012 to head to what is now MADREP. He, along with former Department of Corrections Secretary Ed Wall and former Department of Financial Institutions Secretary Peter Bildston released a letter, an open letter, criticizing Governor Walker. Um, essentially, the gist of it was that they all took their positions in good faith and with the thought that the governor shared their goals in wanting to serve the people of Wisconsin. But as they tell it, they believe that he was more motivated by further political interests, um, seeking higher office, rewarding campaign contributors, things like that, than he was by sort of the the public good uh, service that they had gone in uh, with hopes of of serving. So those three have endorsed Tony Evers, Governor Walker's opponent. I was going to say on top of that, Mark Gottlieb, former transportation secretary, went, also went on record uh, criticizing Walker. And so the narrative has kind of become, wow, there have been four uh, you know previ- previous officials in the Walker administration who are criticizing Walker in the in the run up to this election which is you know I guess that it's isn't, unusual isn't yeah, too common. yeah it's it's unusual um that's right and and Mark Gottlieb has not endorsed Tony Evers but he has been pretty critical of the Department of Transportation under Walker since he's left um yeah it's 
it's unusual. Uh, you know, Walker's campaign has responded basically by just turning to the to the positive and talking about um, the successes of Weedick since Paul Jaden has left. They've, without necessarily criticizing Paul Jaden, basically said, you know, everything's been great since he left. So, um, yeah, you know, haven't heard much from Tony Evers on this as of uh, the time that we're talking about it, but it's an it's a different element. Um, I don't know if this is the kind of thing that persuades voters or if it's just you know, something that you, it gets added to the conversation, but it's an interesting element of this campaign. You feel it like you're just setting up for the ultimate attack ad from like Evers or the Democrats or somebody. You know? Yeah. And, like four former officials all agree. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, uh, you know, and of, of course, you know, with, with each one of them, uh, Walker's campaign has questioned the motives, you know, talked about issues that they had when they were in their jobs. Ed Wall in particular, they've cast a lot of doubts on his credibility. But, you know, it's it's still uh, an interesting message to have out there. All right. Let's talk about pre-existing conditions. It really has been a big talking point, both with gubernatorial candidates, but also within the legislature. So yeah, there and the are a AGs couple. Race and the Senate race. It is it's everywhere. It's Everyone's everywhere. Everyone's talking about it. We yeah. can't stop talking about those pre-existing conditions and uh, what the state might do to cover pre-existing conditions or not, depending on what happens at a federal level. So yeah, Jesse, why don't you just run through who said what this week? So the latest on this, as we are talking now, is uh, Governor Walker has a new campaign ad out pledging to protect coverage for pre-existing conditions, says that that will always be the case as long as he's governor. Tony Evers continues to counter that with pointing to the fact that Wisconsin is part of a multi-state lawsuit seeking to overturn the Affordable Care Act, and then in doing so, overturn the protections at the federal level for insurance coverage of pre-existing conditions. Tony Evers continues to argue if you want to require insurers to cover pre-existing conditions, withdraw the state from the lawsuit. The Republican counter to that is that this can be taken care of at the state level. So Republicans disagree with the structure of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. They believe there are systems that could be in place at the state level uh, that would achieve this coverage um, and, and continue it. So briefly this week, there was a wrench thrown in that argument when Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald talked with reporters um, and raised doubts as to whether there are enough votes among Senate Republicans to pass legislation requiring insurers to cover Mm -hmm. pre-existing conditions. So the Assembly passed a bill a few months ago saying if the Affordable Care Act is ever struck down, the state will still require insurers to cover pre-existing conditions. Now, there's a couple caveats in there, one being if you have a gap in insurance coverage, you can't then come back and and have that coverage Mm -hmm. um, necessarily guaranteed. Um, And that's part of why Democrats didn't support it. But the Senate never took it up. And Scott Fitzgerald said this week that there are still senators who aren't on board with it, and it's because they don't believe in placing mandates on insurance companies or companies in general. So from a few hours, it seems like there is a huge hole in this promise from the Walker campaign. And a few hours later, Scott Fitzgerald put out a statement and said, if this ever happens at the federal level, the Senate will, in fact, pass that legislation. So don't know what happened in those interim hours, but yeah, yeah, the promise has been made. All right. And finally, not so much a news item, but more of just an acknowledgement that we're kind of in the middle of a couple of debates going on. There was an attorney general's debate uh, earlier this week, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Was it? Yeah. 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 And then uh, on Friday night, there will be a debate between the two gubernatorial candidates, Tony Evers and, of course, Governor Scott Walker. And... There's a Senate debate, too. And a Senate debate, too. And guess what? The Brewers are playing the Dodgers, so... And as of last week, I believe you you were indicating that you were leaning towards sports over politics. Well, that was what I did last week when the Brewers were playing up against the Senate debate. But this week, I will be covering the gubernatorial debate and missing the Brewers game. No. Will we be dressing up Pildy in an adorable uniform or something? Yes. Regardless. That's all I care about. <laughs> That's what I'm in it for. Pildy <laughs> will wear her Instagram Brewers jersey. Pick. 
great to cheer on the team. <laughs> That's yes. uh, as a, someone who's generally not super inclined to watch sports. I am in it for the adorable pets in sports paraphernalia on Instagram. Yeah, so we'll have lots of debate coverage coming in the next few days as we inch closer to November 6th. It's, uh, yeah, looms. It looms. Looms on the calendar. Cool. Well, it was great talking to you as always, Jesse. You too, Eric. Thanks for coming in. Cool. Bye. Well, you've had your foot on the gas pretty much since the special election was called. Uh, you, you ran and won that in June, and you immediately had to start running again in November on uh, the first Senate district. Are you tired? How are you doing? Uh, we're doing pretty well. I can definitely tell that uh, you know stress levels are rising, but uh, we've got 19 days to go, and we've done a really good job of keeping it um, you know, really a day at a time. What's on our calendar today? Let's do the best with this meeting, with this set of doors, with these set of phone calls. And so when you keep it in just one day or one meeting, it stays pretty manageable. But I can definitely tell, yes, I am getting tired. But uh, we are almost there. And I think I'm pretty blessed with uh, a fair amount of uh, energy. So we're going to keep that going for 19 more days. Was this your first foray into public office? It is, yeah. So my my mom ran for school board uh, when I was a young kid. But um, I've been interested in politics uh, for a long, long time. I didn't think I'd be running anytime soon. But just based on the experience they had in the private sector and then being involved in my community, Uh, And then just what has happened the last five, seven, eight years, uh, it became, I had a greater sense of urgency to to get involved. And so this is my first uh, foray, the special election was my first time jumping in. What made you decide that the time was right for this? You know, so I think um, I had spent about nine years in banking. And um, during that time, I was a big brother in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. And I just, it's been Monday through Friday, uh, working in, you know, relatively high finance, closing sometimes, you know, seven, eight, nine figure loans Monday through Friday. And then I would spend time with my little brother on the weekends and see his mother working 40 hours a week as a healthcare professional, 20 hours a week, answering phones, going to school part-time and raising four kids by herself and just not getting the same kind of return on her effort that my banking clients were. And so I started thinking and pondering and researching why that was. And between that experience and then uh, working in economic development, which I really enjoyed and was uh, rewarding, and I think we moved the needle, it just became very clear to me that the highest and best use of my skill set to improve the quality of life folks around me was in politics. You grew up in the district that you're running in now. Uh, have you lived there your whole life? What's so the... I grew up very close. Very to close. Okay. Yes. okay. So okay. I, I was born in Stevens Point. Okay. Uh, and then when my parents split when I was four, I moved to Green Bay and uh, lived there through high school. And then I went off to college in Madison. Uh, And then I worked in the Twin Cities for a number of years before uh, moving back to Door County to take the executive director role at the Economic Development Corporation. What made you want to move back to that part of the state? Yeah, so all my nuclear family was there. My mom, my sister, um, and then my dad and brother used to live in Stevens Point. But I have aunts and uncles. My family, I'm very fortunate. Uh, We grew up really close. My mom had five siblings and so I had a number of cousins. So that, uh, that had a big appeal to me. Then I'm a really avid outdoorsman. And so, and I, in 2016, started keeping bees. And so I'm a beekeeper. I have... I grew up, uh, my grandpa had a one acre garden, so I love the idea of having a huge garden someday. So to be able to find uh, a place where I could have a challenging, fulfilling uh, career, but then also have access to world-class fishing on both sides of the peninsula, have incredible uh, hunting opportunities and the opportunity to hopefully own some acreage where I can hunt out the back door was a big part of why I wanted to move back. Uh, The district that you're in, the first Senate district, has been represented by Republicans since the 1970s. Um, You're the first to break that trend in a long time. What do you think led to that breaking in the the vote there? You know, I think we got people really excited. We had really strong turnout throughout the district, but, you know, the people that you know, voted for me. I think they were excited about my private sector background, being able to speak intelligently and understand, you know, financial statements and interpret them and, and take action based on what you're seeing uh, in the business world, I think was helpful. And I think, you know, I, I'm a good fit for the district. I'm a, I'm a pretty average guy in terms of, you know, I spend my free time in the outdoors hunting and fishing and uh, can relate to folks that way. And so I think we just got people really excited and we had a great turnout uh, in a special election. Some of the areas were up to 40%, which is kind of wild to think about. Yeah. Um, so I think just uh, relating well and, and having a, a good reputation within the community helped a lot too. Sure. How would you describe the first Senate district to someone who hasn't spent a lot of time there? 
Yeah, I think we're really fortunate. I I call it, you know, when folks ask about it, it's a really diverse district. So it's all of Door and Kiwani counties, and then parts of Brown, Calumet, Ottagami, and Manitowoc County. So it's really diverse, and it really covers the three pillars of Wisconsin. We've got a really strong tourism industry um, throughout the district. But, you know, of course, you think of Door County, you think of Kiwani County. Uh, we have strong manufacturing uh, throughout the district, and then it's obviously really uh, agricultural as well. So it's really uh, a blessing, I think, to be so diverse industrially that, you um, it, it's a it's an, a unique place in terms of the scenery, and you know um, we've got five state parks just within Door County, let alone the whole district. So people that live there love it, and people that visit there love it. What are the issues that you feel like have been defining this race for you so far? Yeah, and it's really it's been really local issues. So we've we've been focusing a lot on making sure we invest more in our public schools, and and again the district being so diverse, we have a mix of relatively urban schools and rural schools, and making sure they get adequate funding. Uh, I hear a ton about health care. I think. Nearly every door I go to, people want to see health care more affordable and pre-existing conditions covered in the state. And then maybe the most unique to the district is our natural resources focus and mostly on our water quality. So having so much Great Lakes shoreline, folks are really in tune to uh, the effects of, of pollution in the, in the Great Lakes. And then also our groundwater, um, the first Senate district in certain areas has really shallow soils atop uh, what is essentially fractured bedrock. So any pollutants that end up on the soil can end up in the, the water table really quickly. So that's been a huge focus for us as well. What do you see as the biggest contrast between yourself and your opponent, Andre Jacques? Yeah, I think people are really uh, compelled by my private sector background, having spent you know nine years in banking and a couple of years in economic development within the district, having that experience. You know, I think it sets me apart. People tell me that it sets me apart. So uh, I'm really grateful for that experience to, like I said, be able to not just read financial statements and understand economics, but to interpret them, take action based on them, um, and understand the relationship between risk and reward, how to mitigate risk, and how to find you know win-win solutions that I found in the private sector. Um, I think you know there was a lot of talk when you won the special election that you probably wouldn't get called in to vote on anything between that and January, regardless of what the outcome is in November. Now you probably may have to come back. It sounds like they're going to call in an extraordinary session in uh, November later after the election, and you're probably going to have to vote on that Kimberly-Clark bill. Do you know how you're going to vote on that? So we've talked to a lot of folks. That is That comes up quite a bit, um, both at the doors. I've been to Kimberly Clark to meet with their, you know, uh, operations folks and their their employees. Uh, I've talked to people in the community, uh, both employees and other uh, community leaders about it. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that I'll have that opportunity. That's why I ran for office in the first place was to make sure uh, the first Senate district would be represented uh, in discussions like that. And having my, my background and finding those solutions makes me excited. Um, we continue to listen to, to everyone that... Uh, has thoughts on it, and it, it continues to be an evolving conversation. And it, it, the the bill will be different than what they saw in the assembly by virtue. It, you know, it has to be with the non-woven plant, and Nina is going to be closed, which wasn't contemplated in the assembly bill. So mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to, to being part of that conversation. And like I said, that's what gets me excited between the Kimberly Clarks or other economic development deals. I want to be in that conversation, in that debate on the floor, uh, representing the voices of the first district. Looking beyond that, uh, if you're reelected to a full term in, in November, what would the priorities for you be in terms of legislation you'd like to introduce, things you'd like to be involved in, committees you might like to participate in? Yes, yeah, so I've been very grateful to be involved in, uh, to this point, I'm on the board of directors for the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, uh, which I think is a good fit. And again, that's one of the reasons I wanted to be involved was to be a voice uh, on groups like that. But you know, one of my top priorities, and it's been brought to me at the doors from folks, is making sure we depoliticize the DNR. I mean, I think that um, making sure they're adequately staffed and adequately funded for things like monitoring nutrient management plans. And, um, you know, it's funny, as a hunter and a fisherman, I've, I've kind of watched the politicization of, of that organization. And um, it's been frustrating uh, as a guy that, you know, enjoys and wants to have, you know, generations of, of strong outdoors activities. Uh, that's been a top priority for me, whether it's the head of the agency being appointed by the Natural Resources Board versus the governor of either party. You know, I don't think making the state open for business has to mean degrading and exploiting our natural resources. So that's just one of many things. But um, when folks ask, what's the first thing you would like to do? That's kind of what comes up usually. Uh, I'm sure you've had some opportunities to interact with your opponent a little bit, and and you probably don't know him super well, but can you name something that you respect or admire about Andre Jacques? Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a, a strong family man. He's got, you know, five kids and he's got great taste in kids' names. His oldest son is named Caleb, so I, <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, and uh, he's actually, he's a really good singer. And I think I'm a good singer too, but uh, we should have a karaoke off sometime. But yeah, I've, I've heard from folks that he was good. So I said, yeah, Andre, you're a pretty good singer. And I, I heard him sing and yeah, he was. What did he, what did he sing? Uh, he actually sang the, the beginning of the Star Spangled Banner at our first forum. Okay. So, they were doing a sound check, and so we sang the first opening lines, and wow. then uh, we went on from there. So it was good. Okay. Yeah. What would your karaoke 
off include? What would you say? Oh, man. Well, I can't tell you the secret. I have to save the best for last to okay. make sure I win. Okay. But um, I've done everything. I do uh, some Billy Joel to close the night, uh, some R.E.M., um, Steeler's Wheel, Stuck in the Middle with You is a good one. Every <laughs> once in a while, I do a little country. Country is kind of easy for me. I have a lower voice, and I can throw a little twang in there. But uh, a pretty diverse selection. And I think probably my, my favorite go-to, which is kind of cliche, is maybe Bob Seger's Turn the Page. But every once in a while, if I'm in a, if I'm in a good spot and my voice is not wrecked, that one can sound pretty good. I was going to say, that requires a little bit of range, actually. It does, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I just, and that's, yeah, I love Bob Seger. Yeah. Who it's, doesn't? It's but. classic. It is. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> Um, you mentioned hunting. That is a, a huge part of your life and your persona. How did you get into it? Have you always hunted? What do you What do you love about it? Yes, I'm really fortunate to have grown up in a hunting family. So my my dad's family were big hunters, and you know, whenever it was time for bedtime stories, and make him tell me the same story of the buck that he missed when he was 12. I don't know how many times. So bless his heart for telling me the same story a hundred times. But also my mom's family, uh, my uncle, my mom's brother, uh, was kind of my primary mentor in hunting. He got me uh, involved. Uh, right up as I was turning 12, I literally turned 12 the day before the opening of deer season in 1996. So I was in sixth grade and I've been hunting deer since I was 12. Uh, and then the following year, I was really fortunate. I had some neighbors that were incredible waterfowl hunters and so they got me involved in waterfowl hunting. So I've done both of those since I've been 12 or 13. And then within the last five years, a friend of mine got me horribly hooked on turkey hunting. So I've been just obsessed with, with spring turkey hunting, fall turkey hunting, and I've been fortunate to hunt bears a few times as well. But uh, kind of deer, waterfowl, and turkeys keep me pretty busy. I was thinking, so, you, you know, you won the special election in June. Patty Schockner won in January. And you're both Democrats who are bear hunters. And I'm wondering <laughs> if that's the secret sauce for Democratic candidates in you know, special I, elections now. I don't now. think it hurts. I think that <laughs> people appreciate, you know, real candidates that, you know, do enjoy the things that they enjoy. And, and you know, Wisconsin's a great place. I've, I've mentioned that in and some of our social media stuff that just I'm really grateful to live in a place that has world-class deer hunting, incredible waterfowl, and, you know, specifically living in, in the first Senate district, I can go one direction and have the best water, walleye fishing in the country and the other direction and catch, you know, a limit of salmon or trout. And so it's a pretty special place to be. Yeah. So I was asking around a little bit to find out what to, to ask you about. And someone Uh-oh. told me that <laughs> you may have had a hunting experience with Brett Favre. I did, yeah. So those neighbors that I grew up with, um, they were incredible waterfall hunters and gained a reputation for being really good. And so they, through their gun shooting clubs, got to know some higher ups at Shopco and we'd been hunting with them and they were great guys. And they knew Brett from uh, their country club and had been telling him how fun it was. And so Brett kind of said, you know, do you think I could come along sometime? And, you know, we could probably find room for you. And, (laughs) And it was supposed to happen in 1997 and it didn't. And so we were devastated. And then like eight o'clock on a Thursday night, my neighbor calls and says, hey man, pack your bags. Brett's coming tomorrow. You got to be ready to go. We're skipping school. And so of course, growing up in Green Bay, our teachers were jealous. They weren't mad. Right. (laughs) And um, we got out there and Brett Favre showed up and it was like something out of a dream. And he was the kindest, funniest, uh, most down to earth guy. He, uh, I feel terrible telling the story, but I have to, um, he couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. It was back when <laughs> the limit was, was one goose a day. And okay. so the other five or six of us had our geese within the first 20 minutes and poor Brett continued to miss. And I, it was, and he just, he was so de- self-deprecating and humble about it. Uh, but I was frustrated for him, but he was so just endearing. And I, 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 I don't know if I tell the story either, but I, I definitely took the Packer side of the divorce immediately when, when Brett Favre left. But um, <laughs> yeah, that, well, that yeah. day, um, I have nothing but the greatest things to say about the guy. It was I said I remember this too. It was October 9th, 1998. So it was the Friday after the Vikings beat the Packers at Lambeau on, on Monday night. It was kind of Randy Moss's breakout game. So apparently Mike Holmgren is really crabby and, and Farr was telling about this. So it was 20 years ago last week that that happened. Oh, wow. And um, he was just, uh, couldn't have been a nicer guy. And he's much bigger than he looks on TV, that really? guy. Oh, yeah. man, his, and his hands are huge. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, it was a very, and we came back to school and our teachers let us take naps uh, <laughs> to recover from it. I never had a longer hour in my life than when I was driving around after dropping off my disposable camera at Walmart to get the pictures developed. Yeah. Again, my dad was, you know, bless his heart for, you know, driving me around for an hour while we waited for our eight by tens to be developed. And I think I, I literally have the same eight by 10 that has followed me from middle school to high school to college to work cubicles. And now it's in my house in Sturgeon Bay, but um, it's probably time for an upgrade because that picture could use a reprinting. I think. <laughs> that's a, that's a cool thing to have. Yeah. Um, you also do Big Brothers, Big Sisters, you mentioned. What has that experience been like? Why did you learn from that? Why did you do it in the first place? Yeah, so I, my first winter out of college, I didn't keep myself very busy. And uh, living in the upper Midwest, when it's cold and dark, I was like, man, this is not, <laughs> I got to find something more to do than work out and watch The Office. And so <laughs> I had a friend that was a big sister, and she said, you should really look into this. And I did. 
And I remember being, you know, running through the, the application process and seeing different potential matches. And there was one young man who sounded a lot like me that, you know, a little bit husky, loved sports. And so I thought, you know, this sounds like a good match. And we got paired in uh, January of 2009. And it really was kind of a, a life-changing experience for me. Um, his, his, his mother was the most hardworking person I've ever seen in my entire life. And I, you know, I really, honest to God, believe I got just as much out of it as he did. And um, so we were paired for about five and a half years, and we played a ton of sports. We watched movies. We, I, uh, he went through hunter safety, so I brought him hunting. I don't know how it worked out, but at least like every opening day of duck season, he got one duck with one shot. Um, that happened like four years in a row, so that was kind of – I felt bad. I never got him a deer. He, um, After about five and a half years, uh, his family moved to the West Coast. We stayed in touch. It's been a really fun uh, experience, and like I said, I think it's – done just as much for me as it ever did for him, but it was great. So you happen to share a lot of your campaigning experiences on Facebook, <laughs> uh, which is, it's a good insight into yeah, kind of what, yeah. what it's actually like out there. But one that struck me was that you were getting really upset because people were spreading rumors that you were a Vikings fan. Did that really happen? It did, yeah. One of the outside attack ads in the special election said something to the effect of, you know, while well, Caleb Frostman was in Vikings country, and they had photoshopped my head on these incredibly jacked Vikings players' bodies, so I was super grateful. I've always the joke was that I've, I've always been a lineman, not a linebacker. So thanks for the upgrade. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was interesting trying to combat total falsehoods. That you know, I grew up in Green Bay. I spent a few years in the Twin Cities, but I've never, ever, ever in my life donned a Vikings jersey. And if I had, you would still see the rash on my arm. Um, <laughs> but it's 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 funny, and most and most voters know that. You know, even if, if that was the case for a candidate, that that shouldn't matter. But um, it was funny. We got phone calls and, and some of the resistance to, you know, voting for me at the door was, oh, that guy's a Vikings fan. I was like, well, actually, he's not. And he's got other things on his, you know, campaign plate other than <laughs> football fandom. But, um, yeah, that was one of the more frustrating attack ads that uh, as great as I look um, on Photoshop bodies with, you know, guys with 4% body fat, I'm not a Vikings fan. No, it uh, doesn't seem like it. Okay, so going back to Facebook, sort of how we got here in the first place is you you mentioned that you like to <laughs> sometimes you find yourself answering interview questions that you think you'd never get. Yeah. And so I'm going to ask you oh, the geez. interview questions <laughs> that you've prepared your answers oh, for. Geez. And I want to make clear that I did not come up with these questions. These are questions that you've oh, asked yourself goodness. in your own head. So you should have the answers to oh, them. Fair enough. Okay, this is it's a set of three questions. Which film best defines the 90s comedy genre? Well, I'm, I've always been a huge Chris Farley fan, I think, being a, a Husky kid. And I remember the very first time I saw him on TV, the very first time I ever saw Chris Farley do anything was the Matt Foley sketch on SNL and a rerun on Comedy Central. And then, like, the next commercial break was a preview for Tommy Boy. And so for me, uh, there is no better comedy film in the world uh, than Tommy Boy. When Chris Farley's on screen, I just laugh. He can just, like, be on screen and I'm laughing. Uh, and I've literally seen it. I a, gener- a conservative estimate would be 50 times. It might be closer to 100, but there are scenes that I still fall to my chair laughing, and I'm just amazed at his ability to not just inspire laughter, but that movie has a lot of heart yeah. and, and being a Wisconsin kid. And if you watch his movies, he's got references to Aber Gav, and he's wearing Marquette gear. So uh, being a proud Wisconsinite, I love everything Chris Farley, but specifically Tommy Boy. Okay, next question on your list. What's your favorite Metallica song? <laughs> oh, man. Well, it really is Fade to Black. I think Fade to Black is my favorite Metallica song, or might be my favorite song by anyone ever. They've got a pretty amazing live show. I've seen them a couple times. But, uh, yeah, it starts as a ballad, ends with a totally rocking solo and uh, kind of dark lyrical material. But I went, I went, like every young man does, I went through like a 12-year Metallica phase and just got out of it recently. But I, I, I still love them. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of good songs, but that is my absolute favorite. Okay. I want to be clear. I did not come up with this last question. <laughs> oh, I'm not being weird, but you put it on. This is a question you're prepared to answer. What is your ideal date? Well, the joke was that uh, it'd be Netflix and cereal that uh, <laughs> not, I don't have a whole lot of time for doing much other than getting home late at night and starting the dishwasher and pouring myself a bowl of checks and watching either True Detective, The Office, or Parks and Rec for about 20 minutes before falling asleep. So that's all I can fathom as a date these days. But uh <laughs> Yeah, that's why I put that out there. Yes, yes. Uh, God, that's boring cereal. Well, I know, but it, it, it's a play on the it's a play on the other phrase that includes I, I Netflix. Know, I, okay, know, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But okay. cereal sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Wedge Issues is sponsored by WisPolitics.com. You can become a WisPolitics.com member. Find out more at wispolitics.com slash membership. All right. Well, that sets us up well for the actual lightning round portion of this interview where I have come up with questions for you, which is, what is your favorite Wisconsin beer? You know, I actually uh, 
quit drinking many, many moons ago. But when I did imbibe, it was absolutely Miller Lite. I think it truly was uh, a great tasting beer, and it was less filling. So <laughs> it might not be the the uh, the most hipster of answers, but uh, say, okay. yeah, Miller Lite was the go-to. All right. What is the best advice that one of your parents or another person who was important to you gave you when you were growing up? Yes, yeah, so I think it's interesting. I, um, my football coach in high school got a lot out of me, and I don't know if it was specific advice, but he was a great motivator. But my uncle, my mom's brother, the guy that got me into hunting and the guy that I poured concrete with in the family business, uh, I remember one time he dropped me off at our garden and said, you know, get X, Y, and Z done in this amount of time. And when he came back, I'd gotten it done. He said, you have no idea how refreshing it is and how important it is as you go on in life to be known to be able to get things done without somebody looking over your shoulder and and watching every movie you make. I'm really – and he was – he's a great guy. I've been a great mentor, but um, yeah, not hard on me, but just a kind of a hard guy to impress. And so the fact that that impressed him stuck with me. And so I've always tried to get what I'm supposed to get done in the time frame allowed without someone telling me to do it. Uh, what is the the best concert that you've ever attended? Um, it's funny. I went to a Rock the Vote concert in 2004 uh, that was headlined by Dave Matthews to impress a girl. Um, <laughs> and actually, the the opening act, who's still around, uh, My Morning Jacket. Yeah. I was, I'd never heard of them, and they blew me away. Mm-hmm. And the, the So they were the first of four acts. So there were maybe 50 people in the Cole Center. Um, there were more than that, but not many. And uh, they blew me away. Um, so I remember that concert to this day. And seeing Metallica twice was great. The first time was in 2004, and they were a little bit younger, so they sounded great, but they were supporting a bad album, which was St. Anger. So that was kind of lame. They played a lot of that. And then I saw them again in 2009, where they didn't sound quite as good, but they were supporting a better album. So my answer is My Morning Jack, but Metallica was great twice also. Cool. Do you know what your first concert was? I do, and it's really embarrassing. Uh, my friend's mom bought him and his friends tickets to go see Backstreet Boys when we were like 12. And I think she thought she was doing us a huge favor, but that was kind of <laughs> before you were into, into girls, and so we were like one of... 15 guys in Marcus Amphitheater, and um, and it was just super weird and awkward and not not ideal, but yeah. it, was a, it was a very sweet gesture, and um, <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Okay, you went to the Dave Matthews concert. That's a divisive band. Are you, are you pro or anti? Um, ew, good question. So I think Dave Matthews is a really talented guy, and I enjoy most of his music. That particular concert, he was supporting a new album that I don't think was that successful. I listened to Dave play for like 90 or 120 minutes, and I recognized two songs, and I... Yeah. Listen to a lot of Dave. Um, so I, I remember being kind of annoyed by my high school friends that were like just, you know, cult followers of Dave. But I do like his music. I think he's incredibly talented. I wouldn't mind seeing him in Alpine just to say I've gone to see him in Alpine. But yeah. I've I, gone to a, a lot of Alpine shows, not because I'm necessarily a super fan, but because yeah. I have family who are super oh, fans. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. As do I. Yeah. yeah. But he does put on a really good live show. And he did that night too. That's good. Um, political role model or role models. Yeah, I think I aspire to have the energy of Teddy Roosevelt. I don't know if I'll ever have that, <laughs> but I'd like. I mean, to... Didn't he campaign after getting shot? Like, he did. He finished yeah. the campaign after that's getting shot. A lot of energy, right? But I think that's something to strive for. And then I've been um, doing a lot of reading over the last couple of years to so different books that have touched on him. But uh, Dwight Eisenhower, just kind of a slow burn. Um, you know, the guy kept his head down and just did what was in front of him for fifty years, and was a really, I think, progressive president as far as you know, investing in the interstate system and, and being really reflective and, you know, a peacemaker and understanding kind of big picture ideas. And so, um, and no one, no one's ever inspired me like Barack Obama has, but, you know, between the energy of Roosevelt and I think the reflection of Eisenhower, those are the folks I think about. Yeah. Do you have any pet peeves? Uh, I do. Um, I think uh, I call it the podcast and or public radio and or rhetorical right. Like when people like, you know, Saddam Hussein is a terrible dictator, right? I don't know. I hear it all the time. And once you hear it, you can't unhear it. And uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know if it's seeking confirmation for what people, folks are saying, but it is one of those things that for whatever reason, it drives me crazy. Yeah. Um, especially when I catch myself doing it. It happens like once a year. Um, but no, the I don't have very many, but uh, I, yeah, the rhetorical right is one that drives me a little nuts. Okay. Um, do you have any actual pets? I do not. I have uh, lots of taxidermy, uh, but that probably doesn't <laughs> count. I've got... <laughs> A couple of shoulder mounts up in my office in the Capitol and a bear rug at home, but no no okay. pets. No, no living pets. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's the most unique answer I've gotten. Well, good. <laughs> no pets or taxidermy, just stuff I find. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, how do you relax when you get the chance? Um, you know, I like to laugh. I think um, I've done some comedy stuff in the past, but I just I like to laugh. So if it's dumb TV, I think I've watched The Office too many times, but... Um, I listen to books on tape. I listen to podcasts. But if I'm like at the end of a long campaign day, yeah, I will 
uh, cuddle up with a with a bowl of Crispix and uh, put on either Leslie Knope or Michael Scott and just laugh for half an hour. So that's kind of my I, – I, mean, I love exercise too, but generally I think about relaxing these days. It's at the end of the day, mm. and so it's generally just laughing. Yeah. So if you had a Wisconsin bucket list of s- sort of stereotypically Wisconsin things that you've never tried but would like to, what would that be? For me, it's Summerfest. I've never been to Summerfest. Wow. Uh, yeah. I know, and I've got I've had friends that have lived in Milwaukee forever and go every year, and, and I've had friends play at Summerfest, and I do love live music. I'm not a huge crowds guy. I don't like parking a mile away and all that stuff, but that's the old man curmudgeon to me that just needs to get over it because it's a pretty incredible thing to have in Wisconsin. So I will make it there. I don't know if it'll be 2019 or 2020 or 2030, but Summerfest is on my list for sure. Yeah, it's worth checking out. Uh, are you ready for your last lightning round question? Yeah, I am. Favorite Wisconsin cheese? Oh, man. So uh, I think it goes back to fond memories of deer hunting. But my uncle, between when we get in from the cold and uh, before dinner, we'd always have uh, pickled herring on saltines as well as uh, kind of a boring answer, but a a kind of a sharp aged white cheddar. And I remember really uh, enjoying that as an hors d'oeuvre or appetizer before whatever unbelievably heavy comfort food meal we were about to have. And so I ate a lot of white cheddar from Steve's cheese growing up. Excellent. Well, I will thank you for coming in and I will let you close us out with whatever you have as a message for people who are listening. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. And thanks for having me, Jesse. And just, uh, you know, I jumped into the special election back in June because I really truly believe that regular middle class, working class folks have been asked to do more with less for way too long. And as a person that's been in business, I don't think making the state open for business has to mean uh, degrading and exploiting our natural resources. And I'm excited to make smarter investments in broadband, in our infrastructure, in our schools. And um, I think that's what I've been hearing from folks at the doors for the last six or seven months. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have uh, served as the senator to the first district for the last four months and uh, would love to do it for four more years. So thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Wedge Issues. Our theme music is Oh, Wisconsin by Loxley. Now, there aren't a whole lot of Fridays between now and Election Day, and I actually have a lot more to share with you guys between now and then. So you can expect the frequency of these episodes to increase between now and November 6th, and you'll probably get a couple bonus episodes here and there. To make sure that you're not missing anything, you can subscribe on iTunes or anywhere else you get your podcasts. And if you like what you're hearing, remember to tell your friends and leave us ratings or reviews on iTunes. If you have any feedback or suggestions for me, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse Opie, J-E-S-S-I-E-O-P-I-E, or you can email me at J-O-P-O-I-E-N at Madison.com. We'll be back on Monday with that transportation in the 17th Senate District episode. And next Friday, you'll hear from the Democratic candidate for governor, Tony Evers. See you then. Wedge Issues has been brought to you by WISPolitics.com. There are plenty of benefits to becoming a member. You can go to wispolitics.com slash membership to find out more.